Indie rocker Storm Large is a true force of nature on stage and off. Storm and her two brothers grew up in Southboro, Massachusetts. Their mom, Susie, and father, Henry, were called the golden couple by friends. But that image quickly faded. Storm's mother had severe mental illness and was in and out of mental institutions. Fearing that she would inherit her mother's debilitating illness, Storm resorted to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Thankfully, her music ended up saving her life. This powerhouse brought her larger-than-life talents to the stage of the reality competition show Rock Star Supernova in 2006. She went on to create an autobiographical one-woman show about her difficult life called Crazy Enough and has penned a new candid memoir with the same name. You remember that show Supernova in 2006? This very beautiful woman was on there, and she came in like third or fourth or fifth or whatever the hell. And um, you have gone on to have sort of an amazing career. I love your book. Thank you. It Thank is so much. honest. Thanks. It's a memoir about what it's like to grow up in a family where mental illness is prevalent. Yeah. Your mom was sick from the time you can remember. Yeah. And your dad would tell you what about her absences? Oh, uh, when we were really little, it was mom's tired and she's resting in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he was just doing what he knew best to do, which was to, uh, there's a problem, don't tell the kids about it. We're just going to operate as if nothing's wrong, even though something is very, very wrong. Okay, now you were the youngest of three? Yes. And you were how old when it started? God, uh, probably, probably a year. Yeah. And yeah. She, was she ever really diagnosed with anything? Everything. <laughs> right, even back then? Uh, yeah, they... Um, there was a lot of, uh, after I wrote the book especially, there's a lot of people have said that was my mom, that was my dad, that was my aunt. Um, they were very cavalier about how they diagnosed mental illness back then. It yes. was, it was um, manic depression, which is now bipolar. Mm -hmm. It was, um, uh, she was psychotic, she was multiple personality, she was um, suicidal. It was all these different, different things that were, that were just sort of thrown and medicated and they were never right. There's a beautiful part in the bookstorm where you talk about the neighbors sort of just taking you in. Yeah. I totally related to that because, you know, my family, my mom had died and there were five children and, and the neighbors really did step in and yeah. treat us uh, almost as their own kids. We would just eat dinner at someone mm -hmm. else's house. And, yeah. And that, I love the word that you used for it, a momstitute. Yeah. Yeah. Like a substitute, a momstitute. Yeah. Yeah. I had a few momstitutes and I was always on the lookout for new ones and, uh, and I guess a lot of women, when they have kids, they just sort of, this big mom gland starts pulsing, and, they, and, it, and it extends to a lot of their kids' friends. And thank God I had uh, quite a few of those. And um, my friend Daphne's mom, Annie, was, was definitely one of those. Did you covet the attention of the grown-ups, like the teachers at school? Did you? No, actually, um, I, I just wanted to, I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to love me. And I just had this thing in me that there was something wrong with me, something's wrong with me, something's wrong with me. And uh, if I could make somebody laugh, I'd be like, oh, okay, good. I've made you happy in my presence, so I'm, I'm going to be okay for just today. Right. Yeah. You go through a lot of issues that you had in this book, and this was a one-woman show first. Yeah. How did the show come about? You were on stage, you were rocking, you were, I read the whole thing and I loved it. You were in a band, you mm -hmm. were in a bunch of bands, you had yeah. a lot of, uh, you had hypersexuality. Yeah. You were with a lot of different people in different bands. Yeah. And then you sort of were on your own and, and you came up with, I'm going to tell my truth while I sing my songs? Um, well, that, as a songwriter, I kind of, I was never really a confessional songwriter, more metaphoric, but um, I... The way I, my stage banter is very brutally honest. And, and it's not, I wouldn't call myself a stand-up. I'm more of a cabaret storyteller. And hopefully it's funny and hopefully it's, it's reverent, but, uh, irreverent. But um, my director, I did a show called, okay, I did Cabaret in Portland Center Stage. Playing Sally Bowles. Sally Bowles. Fantastic. And it was amazing. My director, Chris Coleman, at Portland Center Stage, was talking to me about the role, and I said, well, you know, she's a dirty club singer that feels unloved, and she does drugs, and she has sex irresponsibly, and that's pretty appropriate for me, so I, I could do it. And so that led to more conversations about my life and my mm -hmm. background, and he said, you know, you should write a one-woman show about your life. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I could uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He goes, no, it should be about your mom. Well, that's what it's really about. It's not yeah. about sex, drugs, and rock no. and roll. It's about a mother who's very ill yeah. and a daughter who's trying to figure out yeah. how to live in spite of that truth. Right. There's a scene where you go to the hospital, you're nine or ten years old, and your mother is quite ill, mm -hmm. and the doctor comes over to you, and you ask the doctor what? Uh, 
Well, I was just trying to make conversation, and I said, well, that's not going to happen to me, right? And he very casually said, well, yeah, you are going to end up exactly like your mother. You know, it's hereditary. But he meant it. It's a monstrous and irresponsible thing to say. You're not to kidding. Kid. But he meant it, I think, uh, that's still the common. That's still the common thinking that it follows along bloodlines. Follows well, there is there lines. is hereditary, and, yeah. Ill, and mental illness is in some way hereditary, right. but it's not definitive. No, it's not. It's not in stone that what what comes from the parents, other than eye color, hair color, you know, other genetics. But you know, addiction is is got uh, it's got genetic uh, connections. But he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He just was. Uh, saying what was common, commonly known. But it was an adult saying something out loud that I had always believed. So. Very sad, that part. Yeah. And I think you're responsible of him. But we're going to take a break, come back, and we're going to talk about um, Storm's mom and her life and what perhaps led to all the struggles she had. We'll be back. Storm Large and the book is crazy enough. And if you haven't read it, you should because it's fantastic. Okay, so, you know, in this book, there's a, a point where you decide you have had just about enough and that in order to be healthy for yourself, you need to go break away from your mom. Yeah. That was a very difficult thing to do, needless to say, right? Um, or were you past the point of no return? I was kind of, I, I, the way I started to develop my independence from my mother started sadly with resentment and, and hatred. I saw everything that she was as a threat to who I was. Um, because of the similarities that I shared with her, I vilified those things in myself. Now, looking back, the adult me, um, my mom was a very sweet, gentle, lovely person who was just there, very damaged. Right. And, but the young me was just like, she's weak, she's girly, she's pink, she's soft, and I'm going to become hard, dirty, brawling, you know. The opposite. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so that's how, my, that's how my breaking from her began. That was its inception. And then, then you got back for like a very brief amount of time and then she passed away yeah and you were given an envelope and the envelope was yes. full of stuff about your mother who was adopted yes and they, they gave you the number eventually of a woman named grace mm -hmm. and she was your step aunt yes yeah at first she didn't quite believe that it was true no um the agency called me and said you know we've we've contacted uh your mother's birth family unfortunately her birth mother is passed on but here's the number for this family she, the mother had gone to her grave and never confessed to anyone at least that that grace knew of who she had confessed that she'd had a child out of wedlock now your mom had sometimes said that she was the product of a rape yeah so that was in the back of your mind yeah but she you know she wanted to be the most unique little snowflake of tragedy that was kind of part of her her narcissism was right. i'm would, sicker than anyone right she'd pretend to have bone cancer oh, yeah. and she'd pretend to do a lot of a lot of things but so you didn't know if that was true or not right but but, it, but when you came to grace and you told her this she was it was almost inconceivable to her that because she had such an image of her mother as so different but you come to find out yeah that she was she was uh living her uh, my birth grand my birth great grandmother was running a speakeasy as a prostitute and so my mother's birth mother was helping in this speakeasy to help raise these other kids and so there was there was all kinds of questions of possibly a rape possibly something pretty terrible happening as uh, and my mother was the result of that did it bring compassion to you in terms of your memory of her oh yes um it was just kind of sadness begetting sadness begetting sadness and there was just she just didn't get a break she never had a chance and um you know writing the book really uh really brought on a lot of compassion for everyone in my family instead of being so angry and my anger was my was my strength right. i thought it was being strong when it was just being angry and trying to be tough i made a lot of terrible mistakes and hurt a lot of people mm -hmm. uh just trying to protect myself and in writing the book i really realized how much my father struggled with everything how much my mother struggled with everything and um uh yeah it's it's uh i have a lot of compassion for her Especially, she loved you. Do you yeah. think she loved you? Very much. I think she tried. From what I got from it is that she tried as hard as she could, yeah. but she didn't have all of the pieces that she needed in her mind or in her soul. How old were you when your mom passed? Ten. You were ten? Yeah. And do you, when, you remember her viscerally, don't you? Yes, but no one spoke about it. Right? Uh -huh. She died and my father said, your mother passed away, and everybody started crying. And I remember being ten, thinking, what does that mean? 
And then no one mentioned her name. And then all of her stuff was out of the house. And it wasn't until I was in uh, college, I was 18, that I told someone she was dead because I almost didn't believe it. Wow. Yeah, my college roommate said, how come you never talk about your mother? And I thought, uh-oh. And I was like, well, uh, she died when I was 10. And it was the first time I said it out loud. Wow. So it was very intense. You Why know? was it such a secret? Or is it just, it's too painful, don't talk about it, move on? Kind of. A little bit what you said about your dad trying to pretend like everything's okay, trying to make everything okay. Yeah. And, and it only has been recently that I've come to be an adult, that I've come to see my mother as a woman, right. as I'm my own woman. Now you're in your 40s, yeah. I'm 50. I found compassion for her in a way that I didn't have before. And we're also lucky to be uh, so much past a lot of the, I mean, it's still some, ACT still is in existence and they're still using it, but it, mental health has gone from the dark ages into the light really in the last 20 years. There's a lot more knowledge out there, a lot more safety, but there's still a lot of, a lot of over-prescribing, yes. especially to kids, right. especially to kids. In but. the book, you talk a lot about yourself, and, and like some of the stuff, you talk about being a hypersexual child, and that's often an indicator of bipolar, mm -hmm. and do you ever have your, did you ever have yourself diagnosed? Did you ever, would you ever do that, or is it, you know, you're, because your mom, you kind of feel like, let me try to make my own way? <laughs> well, that's kind of where the title, Crazy Enough, came from. I went to a therapist, because I was writing the show, and uh, I went to talk to a therapist because it was bringing up all of this other sure, stuff. Sure, I can imagine. And so um, uh, I talked to her about it, and, and uh, she said, you know, if you need to come and see me about certain things, you know, I absolutely feel free any time. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like things are getting too much and you feel like maybe you need to talk to a psychiatrist and maybe get something to keep the depression, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, I think I'm just like, I'm crazy enough. I like... I like the level of crazy I'm at. It keeps me creative. It keeps me working really hard. The things that make me weird and, 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 and a little kooky are unique. just unique. Yes. Right. Yeah. And um, the self-destructive streak, I can still see it, but I, I recognize it and I don't act on it. My impulses are now a little more calm in my older age. Um, so I love how you say, and now heroin addiction in 20 pages. <laughs> right? And you talk about being addicted to heroin, but you were addicted to heroin for like, what, 30 minutes? Not long. Not long. You know, and this is something, uh, this is something to be said for vanity. Uh, vanity has saved me so many times from over, overdoing food and overdoing alcohol and overdoing heroin because remember heroin chic back sure. in the 80s? Oh, it in looked the 90s? like really gone. Gone and, and look like you're on death's yeah. door. Oh my God, that's so hot. Uh, I never looked like that. Had I looked like a, a supermodel when I was doing heroin, I would probably be dead. But right. I was a swollen, I looked like meatloaf. I did not look good. It wasn't a good look. It wasn't a good look for me. And so my vanity like, oh, saved you. Vanity swooped in and said, you know. But it was more than that. It was like, it was also hallucinating. I wanted to kill myself. It was, it was really the bottom. Yeah. Um, but and, you, and you tried heroin for a boy. Yeah. Which oh, is, honey. That, which that broke weak. my heart, too. <laughs> I was like, come on. If I, get, if I get screwed up like this guy, he'll love me, really. Yeah, Just, no. uh, you know, it's, but that's... But girls, so many yes. girls feel like that if, if just somebody loves them, if somebody loves them, you know, then they'll be okay if this guy likes me. Because in our society still, it's, it's men are shown, you know, you, you're, you be strong, you have good character, you get a good job, you, you, you be a leader. Right. And what little girls are told, you get that guy. Right. You get that strong yes. guy. Yes. And so, you know, I never, I was lucky I didn't really have, uh, too much, um, I didn't get too much emphasis on that societal little sniggle. I think probably because you didn't have a traditional family at home to no. try to emulate, right? No. You were trying to just survive and you had to become independent. Yeah. There's yeah. one scene in here that just, you know, broke my heart where um, you were getting, uh, you were stoned and you were um, getting naked or whatever and everybody saw that your underwear was. <laughs> uh, listen, as a kid with no mother, I totally related. Yeah. Because little girls without a mother. Usually, the person taking the dad, if they're in charge, yeah. they don't think about those things, no, right? So no. you would wear like old underwear that was kind of ripped, and and the shame that came with that. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah, a lot of this book resonated. I mean, I didn't have a crazy mother, but I did have a crazy childhood. Yeah, and uh, you're a good a survivor, and you're very talented. Thank you. It's very nice to meet you. Very nice. To Not meet only you. do you have a beautiful voice, but you're a wonderful writer. Thank you. You're very, very, very honest, and it's a great read. Crazy enough is the book. It's out now.